All right. So, um, so I'd like to talk for a few minutes here about LPC's work this summer to help our loons cope with some of the challenges that they have been facing and also present some preliminary results to give you all a sense of what kind of a summer it was for New Hampshire's loons. Start at the beginning, Loon Preservation Committee was created in 1975 because people had noticed that loons were becoming less common on our lakes. And the thinking at that time was that if human activities had contributed to those declines, and it seemed pretty likely that they had, then human activities, if they were thoughtful and coordinated, could reverse those declines once again. And that's the hope and the philosophy on which the Loon Preservation Committee was created. Our mission is to restore and maintain a healthy population of loons throughout the state, to monitor the health and the productivity of loons and loon populations as indicators of environmental quality uh, or the health of our lakes and ponds, and also to promote a greater understanding and a wider appreciation of loons in the larger natural world. So here we are at the Loon Center in Moultonboro. This is our headquarters and our visitor center, but LPC carries out programs of monitoring and research and management and education throughout the entire state. And we're helped in those efforts by close to a thousand volunteers throughout the state. Here are a number of these volunteers at a raft and sign building day this Earth Day in April, right here at the Loon Center. And we also have a small but dedicated staff. So every year we, hum, we hire a number of these seasonal field biologists to help us carry out our work across the state. This is our lineup for 2023. And together our members and our volunteers and our staff do several things. And the first thing that we do is count loons. And so I like to say that our work begins and ends with counting loons because counting loons gives us our first indication of problems with our loon population. And it's the ultimate measure of our success and trying to keep these birds common. So we have been monitoring loons since 1975. In that span of years, we have actually created the longest running and the most comprehensive database on loon populations and productivity that exists anywhere in the world right here in New Hampshire. So this is our North Country biologist, Michelle Adams, setting out to look for loons this year on Cherry Pond, Dave Kavatsky's stomping grounds. And what a beautiful place. This year, LPC volunteers and staff monitored 338 lakes throughout the state. And, and uh, we deal with that large number of lakes by carving the state up into these different monitoring regions. And we assign a biologist to each of these regions. And then we have one biologist each on our largest lakes. So that's Winnipesaukee and Squam. And for the past almost 10 years now, I think we have been actually working with the Umbagog Wildlife Refuge to have one of their technicians count loons on Lake Umbagog and, and uh, report back to us. This year, we actually carved that lakes region up into a west and an east region, and then even carved a little bit of Pemigewasset region out of that as well. Happily, that's because we have more loons. Now, less happily, it's because those loons are facing greater challenges as, as well. And so it's one thing to say that our loon populations are increasing or they're decreasing, but we also want to know what are the factors that are contributing to those changes. And so we do research of various kinds. And banding loons is one of those research activities. And so here's our Monadnock region biologist, Sam Arnold, about to band a loon. It's being held by our outreach biologist, Caroline Hughes, and our Sunapee region biologist, Dylan Ricker. This was on uh, Eastman Pond this summer. <laughs> and we band loons because despite their popularity, there's still a lot that we don't know about these birds. So even basic questions, right? Like how long does a loon live? Do loons mate for life? Do, do the same loons come back, the same lakes, you know, year after year? What is their age at first reproduction? What is their reproductive output over their lifetime? Do the chicks come back to the same lake or the same general area on which they were born? Where do our loons here in New Hampshire go in the wintertime? And what are the migratory pathways that they use to go back and forth? All of those things until very recently were unknown. And even today, they're still based on very limited data. So this is information that we feel we need to have in order to assure these birds of a bright future. So every loon that we ban gets an individual combination of bands. And so um, every bird that we ban gets an, an aluminum, and I'll hand these around, um, an aluminum fish and wildlife service band. And if you have a close look at this band, you'll see that there's a number on these bands and it's a unique serial number. So you can think about this as a social security number, right? For, for a loon. 
But the problem is, as soon as you're a foot away, you can't read those little numbers anymore. And that's why we put these colored, you know, plastic um, leg bands on these looms. And every loon gets an individual combination. So there's only one loon anywhere in New Hampshire, anywhere in North America, for that matter, that's going to have, say, a silver over orange on the left leg and a red dot over a blue stripe on the right leg. And, and with a good pair of binoculars, you can see those band combinations from a quarter of a mile away. Um, and then we can begin to follow those loons over their lifetime and get at these all of these pieces of information that, that we want to know. So this is Caroline holding the Coniston Lake female from this year, sporting her new band. I'll hand these. So this year so far, we spent 14 nights banding and banded 33 new loons across the state. As long as we have a loon in the hand, we take a small sample of blood. We can test that blood for lead, for mercury, for other contaminants, for stress indicating hormones, for blood parasites. We can do genetics work on that blood. So we can learn an awful lot about the health of these birds just by taking that little sample of blood. And this is uh, Sam again, drawing a sample of blood from that same Eastman Pond loon. We also clip a couple of feathers and we can test those feathers for mercury. In the past, we've tested them for cyanobacteria toxins. We can do genetics work on the feathers as well. And this is Caroline clipping a wing feather of a loon caught on Pleasant Lake in Deerfield this summer. We also collect inviolable loon eggs from failed nests. So once we're absolutely sure that those eggs are not going to hatch, we will go in and try and get those before a scavenger or a predator gets them. This is Sarah Kanicki, our West Lakes region biologist, collecting loon eggs from a failed nest on Lee's Pond just across the road here this summer. That, those are uh, two of 94 eggs we collected from failed nests in 2023. We will test some of those eggs for a wide range of contaminants. So here is our Squam Lakes biologist, Tiffany Grady, taking some measurements of an inviolable egg collected from Squam Lake before logging it into LPC's freezer. Tiffany and LPC were able to continue our work to understand and reverse the declines of loons on Squam Lake, thanks to the generous support of donors to our Squam Lake Loon Initiative. And LPC submitted a comprehensive report on the uh, results of its egg testing to date to the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services and the, the uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. This is back in November of 2021. And that report caught the attention of those agencies. New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services is now funding the analysis of 144 loon eggs collected from failed nests over the past six years for PFAS, which we all know is that is one of these forever chemicals that's becoming a cause of great concern uh, among researchers now. And those eggs are at the laboratory now. We also work to rescue loons in distress. Those rescues began early this year as we found six loons trapped in a small pool of open water in the broads in Winnipesaukee in February. Warm weather and open water meant that those loons stayed on Winnipesaukee too long. And by the time the ice closed in on them, they were into their winter wing feather molt, which meant that they could not fly away. So uh, we got some help from the Tufton Borough Fire Department with some rescue uh, folks in an airboat. On that first day, LPC senior biologist John Cooley and Caroline and crew caught four birds. And that was a long day in the lake for all of them. The next day, John and I suited up and set out to catch the rest of them. No airboat this time. And uh, it felt like a long walk uh, to that open water uh, over successively thinner ice as the ice cracked under our feet. My board is always telling me that I, I need to uh, delegate more. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to do that. So I had John, I had John go first across that ice. <laughs> and that was another long day as John caught the last two loons. So here's Caroline labeling a vial of blood that she just took from one of those uh, birds. From here, they went to the Caves Veterinary Clinic in Concord for x-rays and then to Wildlife Rehabilitator Maria Colby for rehab and feeding. And then we were able to release all six to the ocean. So here's one of those birds being released by John and Maria. So our rescues continued through the year. Here are Caroline and Michelle right after they rescued a loon on a tiny unnamed pond in Colebrook. Uh, that pond was so small that the loon landed on it, but was unable to take off again. So that's why it was in need of rescue. Mm -hmm. 
And here's Michelle releasing a loon rescued from Big Brook Bog in uh, Pittsburgh. So in total, we have rescued 24 loons to date this year, and there will be more before the year is through. Not all rescued loons uh, can be released again, though. Our less fortunate loons have historically gone to Mark Pokris, a veterinarian at the Cumming School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. So one of the best ways of finding out what's affecting loons at a population level is to find out what's killing individuals. So we have been sending dead loons to Mark since the mid 1980s and he has been telling us what they died of. So this for instance is how we found out about lead tackle and the issue of lead tackle in our loons. Mark retired a number of years ago now, but not really. He's continued to help us. And one of the many ways Mark continues to help us is by sending great veterinarians and veterinary students our way. So here is Emily Gurdon uh, in the Loon Center lab downstairs doing a health check on a chick that was rescued this summer. In a typical year, one of the prime causes of adult loon mortality would be ingested lead fishing tackle, like this poor loon that we picked up on Round Pond in Pittsburgh last year. So far this year, we have picked up only one lead poison bird, uh, bird you know, one lead poison loon. And that is one too many, uh, but it is a lot better than the 11 or 12 that we have had in some other years. And I'm gonna take that as evidence that our lead tackle buyback program is working. This is the sixth year of that program to give $10 vouchers to people who hand in their old lead tackle at participating tackle shops so that they can buy loon safe, non-toxic tackle. This year, we added seven tackle shops to our program. Here is Caroline at one of those new shops, the North Country Angler in Conway uh, with its owner, Steve Angler. We are now at 17 shops, giving out vouchers throughout the state. And at each of those 17 shops, the person turning in the largest amount of tackle this year is gonna get a check from LPC for $100. And the person handing in the second largest amount of tackle at each of those shop, shops will get a check for $50. And so we're serious about keeping this lead out of our loons and out of our lakes. Please do visit loonsafe.org for details of that program and a list of retailers that are participating in it. So far, we've collected over 50,000 pieces of lead tackle through that program. This is Logan Cron, our lead tackle buyback intern with his lead tackle buyback display at the Loon Festival this summer. We also work in other ways to minimize human impacts on loons. And so we float nesting rafts to help loons that have been displaced from their traditional nesting sites because of shoreline development or recreational use. These rafts also help loons that are on lakes with changing water levels because they float. So they go up and down as those water levels change. This is John floating a raft on Hawkins Pond this spring. This year, LPC staff and volunteers floated 148 of those nesting rafts on lakes throughout the state, which was a new record. Here is LPC uh, volunteer Janet Yardley floating a raft via paddleboard on Spoonwood Lake this spring. That is not something that I had seen before. <laughs> and those rafts were successful. So more than one of every four chicks hatched in the state this year came from a raft floated by the Loon Preservation Committee. This is Caroline floating a raft on Upper Baker Pond this spring. We also float signs and rope lines around nesting loons to give them the space that they need to incubate those eggs and hatch those chicks successfully. This is our Winnipesaukee biologist, Everett Fidian Green. Uh, in, the, in the back there, you can see LPC biologist emeritus, Ralph Kirshner. Uh, they're building signs in our Kitty and John Wilson Field Operations Center. We protected 119 nesting pairs of loons with signs this year. Uh, here are Logan and our East Lakes region biologist, Senna Doneski, floating signs on Bear Camp Pond this summer. Pairs protected by signs hatch more than one of every two chicks hatched in the state. So here are uh, our volunteer, Ann Hare Lambie and Logan putting out signs and rope lines on Silver Lake this summer. Once those chicks are hatched, we will sometimes float these caution loon chick signs to slow down boat traffic in brooding areas. This is our Pemajuasa biologist, Will Crone, and volunteer Ken Jewell floating one of those signs on Winnesquam this summer. We also worked with dam owners to try and maintain stable water levels during those critical loon nesting periods, which was a challenge uh, this year. Uh, and altogether, more than three of every four loon chicks hatched in the state 
benefited from LPC's management efforts this year. And we're confident that every loon benefited from our educational efforts. And so those included our new educational signs posted at access points of lakes. We gave in-person talks at lake associations and other venues and right here at the Loon Center. And we continued our partnership with the Squam Lakes Natural Science Center to have Tiffany give loon cruises on Squam. Caroline and our outreach intern, Melanie Carolyn, also led guided loon watching paddles on many lakes. This is a guided tour on Pemigewasset Lake. And so far this year, we have given 130 of these in-person talks and paddles. Caroline has continued to expand our Loon Preservation Committee website. We have a lot of information there on loon natural history, including the calls of the loon and loon behavior. And we have information about our work in support of Loon. So please do check us out at loon.org. Caroline continues to publish our LPC e-newsletter as well. That now goes out to more than 6,300 people. Our Instagram account has over 1,300 followers. Our YouTube channel has over 7,000 subscribers now. And Caroline also updates our Facebook page. We have over 13,000 followers. <laughs> yeah. LPC's Loon webcam enthralled people and animals once again this summer. We had over 360,000 human views and uh, close to 40,000 chat messages from people all over the United States and the world. So LPC super volunteer Bill Gassman and a number of LPC staff members all put in a huge effort to broadcast that nesting pair of loons to the world. And so we've been working hard to get the word out in different ways this year. We also have a number of events to celebrate loons and our fascination with them. The third Saturday of July is an important day for loons in New Hampshire. It starts with our Loon Census, which is our annual effort to get as many people as possible out in the lakes counting loons between eight to nine o'clock in the morning. This is Dylan looking for loons on Census Day. We had 440 people and at least two Labrador Retrievers take part in that fine tradition. I will say that one of my dogs is obviously taking her census duties more seriously than the other. But altogether, we counted 489 uh, loon adults and chicks, uh, and those figures are rolled up into our season-long monitoring. We then, then starting at 10 o'clock that same day, we had our loon festival. So Meredith Rotary was there with free hot dogs and ice cream for everyone. LPC biologists gave loon talks in the garage of our Kitty and John Wilson Field Operations Center. You could dunk a loon biologist if you uh, answered a loon question correctly, or even if you couldn't, but contributed a dollar to the cause. And there were kids crafts and a live band, and you can even get your face painted. So here is Sarah being painted by former LPC field biologist, Emily Landry, who comes back to help to volunteer for us every year on our loon festival. So it's been a busy and a challenging year. And like all nonprofits, we rely on our volunteers to help us in our work. So I'll take this opportunity to thank all of our volunteers and supporters for your help this year. We could not do this work without you. Thank you. And soon enough, it was time to pull our rafts and signs off the water again to wait for another spring and another loom breeding season. And then take all that data that we collected over the course of the summer and enter it into LPC's database. And that's not exciting work, but it is important. This year, we entered a 49th year of data on loons and our work to preserve them into that LPC database. And here are the results uh, of that work. And so um, the good news here is that in 2023, we had more than four times the number of paired adults as we did when we began our work back in 1975. And paired adults, and this is the red line, this is simply an adult that pairs up with another adult that will defend uh, a lake or an area of water from intruding loons and has at least the potential to breed and to contribute to that next generation. So again, these numbers are preliminary, um, but it looks like our number of paired adults was level or might even you know, have gone down a pair or two. Right now that stands at 343 pairs. 
but we are still going through a pretty exhaustive uh, uh, you know, procedure of checking these things. So those could, go, uh, those could still go up or down by a, a few pairs. Now, only a proportion of those pairs breed. That's the black line nesting adults. And that was actually up from last year and set a new record uh, this year. But chicks hatch and chicks survive, uh, surviving were down markedly uh, from the records that we set last year. And so as nice as it is to see this general, you know, long-term upward trend, we still got a long way to go to reach historical levels of loons in New Hampshire and levels that we think New Hampshire's lakes could and should support today. That's somewhere in between those two green lines. And it's getting harder, you know, to continue that recovery. If we go a little deeper into that data, we get these relative reproductive success uh, parameters. And so the blue line on this graph is the proportion of territorial pairs that nested. So this year, that was about 70% of territorial pairs that actually nested. And by that, we mean created a nest and laid at least one egg in that nest. And that's pretty much right on the long-term average. The red line is hatching success. And that's, as you can see, that's by far the most variable of these statistics. This year, we had about 0.8 chicks hatch per nesting pair, and that is one of the worst results that we have seen in all of our years of, of monitoring. And then the green line is chick survival. So once a chick was hatched, it had about a 70% chance of surviving till this point in the season. That is close to our 10-year average, but there is a slight hint here, maybe, of a downward trend. So this is something that we're going to be keeping our eyes on. And if you put all those trends together, right, so the fact that only a proportion of territorial pairs get to the business of nesting, those nesting pairs have a, a certain number of chicks hatched, and then a proportion of those chicks hatched survive to this point. We come up with this statistics, uh, statistic, chicks surviving per territorial pair. So the red line on this graph is 0.48, chicks surviving per territorial pair. And that's the number that we know from research conducted by Loon Preservation Committee and by other organizations, we know that we need to hit that line as often as not to maintain a stable and a viable loon population in New Hampshire. And of course, we want to do more than just maintain. We want to continue to grow and to recover our, our loon population. So in 2023, we were well below that line. And this is an important graph because the periods in New Hampshire where we have experienced the strongest growth in our loon population they can date back to those times, right, where we have spent a good number of years well above that red line. And recently, as you can see, it's been harder to stay above that red line. And so our concern as we look at this graph is that as we continue to lose adult limbs from lead tackle ingestion or from monofilament entanglement or from collisions with boats or jet skis or just natural causes, where are the chicks gonna be coming from to replace those adults that we're losing? So the good news here is that even with this bad year, we have been at or above that line for six out of the past 10 years. So this year, 51% of loon nests were successful. That is lower than last year. Some of those nests resulted in only one chick, right? So that's success light, but it's still success and, and we will take it. Of the nests that failed, close to half of them fail for unknown reasons. And this is because, you know, a raccoon, or, a, or a, a mink or an eagle can swoop down and, and take an egg in a blink of an eye. And unless we have people, you know, unless we have eyes on that nest at, at the exact moment that that happened or a camera trained on that nest, often we simply don't know what caused that nest failure. But of the known causes of nest failure, we humans play a role in most. And so human disturbance is obvious. This is just people getting too close to an incubating loon and flushing that loon off of the nest. Even there, there's good news, because if that happens and you turn around and leave the area right away, the chances are pretty good that that loon will get back on the nest in 20 or 30 minutes. But the danger is that on a really hot day, that egg can cook on the nest. On a cold and a rainy day, it can chill. Either one of those can kill an embryo developing inside of that loon egg. And it also leaves those eggs exposed to any predators that are working their way along the shoreline or flying overhead and looking for an easy meal. And so many of those predations may have a human component as well. So populations of egg predators like raccoons and gulls have benefited from their close association with people. So they've been eating our trash, they've been fruitful, they multiplied, and their populations are now at unnaturally high levels, which can put pressure on loons and our other native wildlife. And again, some of those predations may well have happened only after people flushed that loon off of the nest. 
But the big story in 2023 was, were these floodings, right? And we bear some responsibility there as well, because many of our lakes are impounded. And if we put a dam at the outflow of that lake, then we have some you know, amount of, of control and responsibility for where that water level is on the lake. Also, we humans love to pave things, right? And so um, by doing that, we create these impermeable surfaces. And instead of sinking into the ground, that water sluices across those paved surfaces and then right back into our, uh, our lakes and ponds. Um, and of course, there was the astounding amount of rainfall um, that we have this summer due at least in part to climate change. So the benefit of having 49 years of data is that we can look back and see how loons fare in wet years and in dry years, in hot years, in cool years, in years with heat waves and in years with storm events. And so we know that a lot of rain and rain events increase nest failures of our loons. And in June, we didn't have record rainfall, but we had almost exactly twice the normal amount of rainfall. So by the end of the month of June, our ground was saturated. And then any additional rainfall that came down had no place to go except right into our lakes and ponds where they raised those water levels. And then we had a record wet July, right? And so um, we actually had more flash flood advisories in the month of July in New Hampshire than we had had in any previous year in this state. So that caused a lot of, of nest failures. Uh, and the concerning thing here is that those rainfall and those storm events are all predicted to increase with climate change as we go into the future. So rafts, you know, can help in a year like this, uh, but we set new records for the rafts that we put out and, and it was not enough, you know, to compensate entirely for that huge amount of rainfall that we, uh, that we saw. And we would all like to see loons nesting on a piece of natural shoreline, you know, if they're able to. And many loons seem to feel the same way because only 35% of the rafts that we floated this year were actually used by loons. So it's, it's kind of painful, right, to see a loon nesting on a piece of natural shoreline and then get flooded out when we had floated a nesting raft just 10 feet away uh, for it. But they make their uh, own choices. Some loons take to rafts and some loons don't. So we're continuing to research ways to help loons cope with the changing climate and all of their other challenges. We'll continue to put the results of that research to work in focused management and focused outreach to help our loons thrive in the future um, in the hopes of continuing that recovery and maintaining that viable population of loons here in New Hampshire. And so to wrap up for our volunteers and, its, and our staff, it was a summer of good work to benefit our loons, sometimes under beautiful blue skies, and sometimes not, and maybe most of the time not. So here's our Seacoast region biologist, Ethan Hobbs, enduring a typical day this summer. And if the rain, if the rain let up for a few minutes, there were still all the usual challenges like wind and bugs to contend with. And then when the sun was shining, we were dealing with high heat and high humidity. So here's poor Ethan soaked in sweat after hauling his kayak back from a remote lake, and I don't think Ethan dried out all summer. So we had a great field crew though, and they remained happy and upbeat through what was a challenging summer for them as well as the loons. They continued to count loons even on a rare day off. And they worked hard and it was good and it was necessary work for our loons. And of course, there's still much work to be done, right? And the impacts of LPC's work go far beyond loons and far beyond New Hampshire. Loons are sentinel of environmental quality. They're an indicator of the health of our aquatic ecosystems. So they're scientifically important and they have this wide public appeal. And that is why they have found themselves to be the focal point of so many of these environmental issues. And that means that if we can save loons, then we can save a lot of other species that depend on the same clean water and quiet places. And I like to think that at the same time as we've been working to recover our loon population, we've also been working to encourage an environmental ethic. And that's something that's going to benefit not just loons, but other wildlife and even the people and the economy of New Hampshire. Because after all, that's a large part of the reason why so many of us want to visit or to live here. And so I hope that the end result of all of our efforts will be a bright future for loons in New Hampshire. And I prefer to think of this as a sunrise photo. So. That is the end of my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions that folks have about loons or LPC's work in support of loons.
Yes, Dave. Harry, was this an unusual summer for single chick patches or was it? Yeah, yeah. So a greater, last year, what made the difference is that we, uh, of our successful nests, we had a greater proportion of two chicks patch from those nests. And, and so it's interesting because there's, there's been a good deal of speculation as well. I mean, could temperature effects, could water, you know, rainfall effects and things be just increasing the number of loons that become inviable for what, whatever reason, even to the point of, of having one egg and a two egg clutch become inviable and then having only one egg hatch, you know, from, from those. So, and uh, Dave is, you know, these are still, we're right at the beginning of trying to figure this out. So it was all that we could do to put together the, the main, you know, numbers. But over the fall and the winter, we will be digging into questions like that and, and uh, determining what we can find and, and how we can um, help loons better, in, you know, uh, as a result of those findings. Yeah, Dana. In terms of the uh, Dam Bureau's regulations, what can dam operators do when they have these large water yes. uh, increases? Yes. Can they drop the level of the lake or are yeah. they restricted from how much they can yeah. send downstream? Boy, so Dana, that's a good question. And I'm not exactly sure what the answer was. I will say that in a year like this, you know, if, with the best of intentions, I think dam operators were taxed to keep those water levels stable. Uh, because so often, you know, these lakes are part of a chain of lakes. And and so, and as, you know, our old board member, Ralph Kirshner says, you know, if you open the floodgates on, on Winnipesaukee, you flood downtown Laconia. Um, as, you know, and, and so sometimes there's a limit to what we can do. If we are able, you know, with 2020 hindsight, and we could we could really figure out how to anticipate when there's a large rain event coming and, and preemptively, you know, draw down lake levels a little bit. But that's, you know, that's a risky business as well and difficult to do. The next year, we can really explore this with the Dam Bureau further to yes. give dam operators, because there has been in, uh, for many years now, a letter that was sent to the dam operators from LPC and yes. the state with instructions that they should anticipate water increases from rainfall and begin to draw down their lakes. Yeah. That did not happen on my lake. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And and I think, you know, continued outreach to those dam operators, which I'm sure Dana, you will make sure happens uh for, for us as, as well, um, is is going to be very helpful in in doing that. And as I said, this year, um, I, I think it was uh we were you know, taxed to be able to cope with that because uh, the amount we, I don't think anyone really could have anticipated the amount of rainfall. As you saw, we were almost off the chart, you know, on that, on that rainfall um, graph. And as the interesting thing as well, though, is as John was creating this graph, um, he and I had a conversation downstairs in his office and, and updating this from seven or eight years ago, there were a lot more points in that high and the, and the high right hand side of that graph. So summers are getting rainier in, in New Hampshire. And I think that we're going to probably have more of these really challenging years for our loons. And the, the, the years like last year, where things are moderately calm and we can really make hay and have a, a bumper crop and yeah. records. Uh, right, it, right. And so um, those may become fewer and further between. So our challenge will be to mitigate as much as possible bad years like this one, and then make sure that we make the most of those good years going forward. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have data for a two egg, a two catching nest, dominant chick pushing the second board? Yeah. Data? Yes. Yeah. We do have, you know, data on how many of those second chicks, you know, survive from two egg, you know, clutches. And, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's more or less a 50 50 proposition, you know, or it's in that range in, in any case. So some two egg, you know, some broods with two chicks, they get along fine and they can bring those two chicks off and others, you know, there is a little bit of sibling rivalry um, and things. The interesting thing here is that parents don't play favorites. They will simply feed the first chick that comes to them. But that dominant chick means that it's the first chick that gets there. And this is where, for instance, it's really important as we observe loons to be able to give these birds some space, right? So I always say there's only one way to get close to a pair of loons on the on the on the you know the water and that's with a good pair of binoculars right there's only one way to take a photo of of loons on the on the lake and that's with a long telephoto lens because as soon as we get too close to these loon families 
what happens is they stop what they were doing, which is the reason why we wanted to observe them in the first place and begin to react to us as a potential threat or potential predator. And when that happens, feeding is reduced. And when that happens, that second chick doesn't get fed. And so this is one of those reasons why we always advocate for people to keep their distance, you know, from, from loons and let them do their thing on the water. So this is one concrete way in which we can help these loon families and have more of those second chicks survive. Yes, Bob. Harry, tonight we had a nice presentation on the income and expense side of the income right here. Yeah. Could we get in future years and maybe could I get this coming week copy of the balance sheet? Sure, absolutely. Okay, good. Yep, we can absolutely do that. Good. Yes. Um, what about the destruction of the shoreline, wake boats, and so on? Yeah. Impacting the population? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of the wake boats, and oh. and um, and so. Um, you know, th these things, I, I don't think that the increase in the amount of shore shoreline erosion um, and the amount of cyanobacteria blooms and increased turbidity in the water is unrelated to the increase in the number of wake boats that are, you know, causing these large waves and roiling up the, the bottom. And, and so it's probably the last thing, you know, that New Hampshire's lakes need. And I mean, looking at it, it looks like great fun. And and uh, but I think that there's probably a time and place to do that, which may be way out in the broads on Winnipesaukee and not, um, you know, on our smaller lakes or closer into the shoreline, you know, for, for doing mm -hmm. that. So we do lose, you know, and we did lose nests to to wakes. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know if that's from a wake boat or if it's from a motor boat. But we know that wake boats throw, throw these big waves uh, and that can uh, flood a loon nest and it can wash an egg right out of a loon nest as, as well. So it's definitely something that we're going to want to keep our eye on going forward. Yeah. And what can you do about it? Well, we actually work with New Hampshire Lakes Association and we and we are um we helped to fund a study in the Midwest about the kinetic energy of those waves and and uh what would be protective in terms of an increased no wake zone, you know, so requiring those wake boats to be further out from shore as they do their thing. Um and and so uh, the study, you know, gave very useful results. We were part of a coalition of, of organizations that presented that to the New Hampshire legislature. Uh, the wake boat industry is pretty powerful and they pushed back and, and that uh, legislation did not go anywhere. But I feel like we'll we'll continue to to work that. And of course, we can educate people, you know, as well. If they know that these uh, wake boats can do harm to loons if they're not used in appropriate areas of the lake, the hope is that people will be able to do that. And and. Uh, and you know our our entire um, philosophy here at LPC is that loons and people can thrive in each other's company, right? If we if we follow a few simple precautions. Right? So I think probably just one more question, and then we we should. His John Rockwood's presentation is still coming up as well. Sandy, All right. uh, on Swamp Lake this year, for the first time in my memory, more loon chicks were lost oh. because of attacking loons than yeah. any problem at all. Yeah. Yes. Well, and Sandy, I would I would argue that that is in part a man-made problem as, as well, because as you know, the uh, uh, Squam has had a tumultuous recent history, and and so we saw the greatest decline that we've ever observed in in the nesting uh, pair or territorial pairs of loons on on Squam Lake, and since then we've seen higher than average mortality from a number of causes, including lead tackle, and in that case, so you know, as as Tiffany will say. Loons have evolved to thrive in a in a, a stable environment and a stable social structure. And Squam's lakes have really had neither of, of those. And right, there we go. Right. <laughs> but um, but it's it's interesting. And this this gets at, you know, some of the, the intricacies of this loon work as, as well, because um, not only has continued mortality on, on Squam Lake resulted in this churn, because as soon as there's a vacant territory, nature abhors a vacuum, other loons flood in. And then they create this tumult and and confusion and and, and things. Um, and so there is there is definitely that issue. But there's also the issue that some of the contaminants that we are finding in loon eggs on Squam have been shown to increase aggressive you know behaviors in in animals and in people. And it may also be the same thing on Squam as well. And so there are a number of of factors there that are at play. I think. Yeah. Great. Oh, all right. One one last question. Sure. I keep on saying that. Yeah, so we have a couple of, of chicks that were born um, only like a, they're probably only two or three weeks old. 
now. And, uh, and But we're confident, especially if it's a single chick, that's getting all the attention of those parents or stuffing it full of food. And, and uh, there likely is not, it will be fine. So yeah, we wouldn't want it to delay for much longer. And this one may just kind of, you know, get out, you know, under the wire, uh, but it will probably, I would think that it would be fine. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. And as you so Caroline is, is going to bring up um, John's presentation as he, as they, as she does so, I'll just take a minute to introduce John. So um, John is a noted uh, wildlife photographer. He is, uh, and he's also, uh, thankfully, a he's been a hard